David, good morning, everybody, and good afternoon for those who are living uh, in Europe or in Israel. So we are very happy to be here with you again today. And we have, as you said, David, the privilege, we are privileged today to have with us uh, Professor, uh, Doctor, Doctor, not Professor already. I, I, I give him too much credit, uh, Emmanuel, I'm sorry. But you're, you're just Dr. Uh, Emmanuel Navon, who is one of the Israel's leading foreign policy expert. He's uh, speaking a wonderful French, but unfortunately for me, we'll speak today in English. Uh, and uh, we, we have a great cooperation with uh, Dr. Navon uh, for years now. And he's participating in quite all, all our uh, uh, activities. So we are very happy to, to have him with us tonight. Uh, as you said, David, we will speak a little bit later about this delegation that was in Israel during the last during four days, a few days ago. It was the, the, the most important ever uh, delegation of members of the French parliament that came to Israel. I, I think one of the most important coming from Europe these last years and certainly since the beginning of this uh, global pandemic. Uh, we will speak about that. We will have some uh, slide also to, to present you and we will have a, a conversation about also this delegation. But let's let's go. Uh, first, to, to what is the, the topic of our uh, meeting uh, tonight? It will be about Iran, terror concern, changing France's ties with Israel, which is very important. And also, perhaps that's why I'm the moderator of this uh, of this conference. So I will I will move to you, Mr. Navon, my friend. There is the first question: um, Are we are we headed to a new chapter in Israel uh, uh, EU relations with the new Israeli government? And what are the latest developments? And I would like to say to our friends that you will you were very active in the campaign uh, with uh, Gideon Saar, and perhaps you will tell us a little bit more also about that. The floor is yours, my friend. Thank you, uh, Arié, and thank you for uh, thank you to Elnet for hosting me again. It's always a privilege to uh, to address uh, Elnet, as uh, Arié mentioned. Uh, I also addressed the uh, French delegation. A couple of weeks ago, it was a very impressive uh, delegation. Uh, another confirmation of the great job that uh, Elnet is doing to try improve and to improve the uh, relation between Israel and Europe in general, and with France in particular. Now, regarding the uh, the impact of the new government on Israel-European uh, relations, uh, the answer, the, the the short answer is yes. There is going to be a change. Uh, what is this change going to be? Well, first of all, now we have a, a full time. Uh, Foreign Minister Yair Lapid, uh, who took upon himself, among other things, to uh, kind of rebuild the status of the uh, Foreign Ministry uh, in Israel, which had been uh, diminished in the past uh, in the past few years, to bring it back uh, to the core of Israel's uh, foreign policy. Uh, in the past few years, the the policy of uh, the, the the government under Netanyahu's leadership. Uh, was to diminish the foreign ministry and to basically conduct Israel's foreign affairs uh, via the National Security Council uh, and the Defense uh, Ministry. Uh, today, the foreign ministry is back, and uh, Yair Lapid and his advisors have uh, a clear agenda when it comes to Europe. Uh, what is the difference going to be? Well, mostly I would say that under Netanyahu, uh, the policy was to uh, divide and rule by getting closer. Uh, mostly to the governments of Eastern Europe, uh, what is known as the Visegrad Group, which includes Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, uh, and uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, also the Baltic state. And the strategy was basically to block uh, decisions from the uh, European uh, Council of Foreign Ministers regarding Israel uh, and the Middle East. And, and this policy was successful in blocking uh, hostile decisions, uh, definitely. In other words, uh, when the council tried to uh, condemn, for example, the decision of the Trump administration to transfer the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, so Israel was able to block the decision thanks to the veto of, um, of countries such as Poland or, or Hungary. But on the other hand, the, uh, uh, this policy did alienate Israel uh, with many of our traditional allies in uh, Western Europe. Why? Well, because most of those governments are uh, what is called uh, Eurosceptic. They're very critical of the European Union. Uh, some of them, especially Hungary, uh, have a close relation with uh, Vladimir Putin, with Russia. And therefore, 
Israel also paid a price uh, for this policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its old allies in uh, Western Europe. So what Lapid is trying to do today is try and uh, rebuild the trust between Israel and uh, what Ronald Rumsfeld used to call old Europe. Uh, but these are the most important countries in, in Europe, of course, such as France uh, and, uh, and Germany. And uh, Lapid traveled to uh, Europe recently. Uh, he met with uh, most European leaders in, in, in Brussels. Definitely his agenda is to uh, rebuild a relation of uh, trust uh, with uh, Brussels and with Israel's traditional allies in Western Europe. This is important because, uh, as you know, uh, France, for example, and we'll talk more about France um, with the following questions, but France is a very important ally for Israel today, despite our many political uh, differences, especially regarding France's uh, voting patterns at the uh, United Nations. But at the end of the day, France today is the country in Europe that is leading the military struggle against the jihadists in the Sahel, in Africa, and its fleet, the French fleet, uh, has a crucial role in uh, the Eastern uh, Med, in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, to fence off uh, Erdogan and his uh, destabilizing policies uh, in, the, in the East Mediterranean. So it is important definitely to rebuild this relation with, uh, with our allies in, in France and Germany. As you know, Britain is no longer a member of the, uh, of the European Union. But uh, what is to expect, again, to, uh, to wrap it up uh, regarding uh, the new government on our relations with Europe is, uh, is to, uh, to try and, uh, and repair, I would say, uh, the trust uh, between Israel and, uh, and the large countries of Europe, the main actors uh, in the European Union, and make sure also, we'll talk about it later, that Israel is... Uh, is added, is integrated into the uh, research and development program uh, of the European Union, what is called uh, uh, Horizon. Uh, and last point, of course, uh, when it comes, for example, to the decision that Israel is trying to promote at the Security Council uh, to condemn Iran, here also you do need, of course, the votes of Britain and France, uh, who are permanent members of the uh, Security Council, at least uh, to avoid their veto. Uh, and therefore, it is, uh, it, it is of, uh, of high importance uh, I would say, to rebuild uh, the trust and the relationship with those countries. Thank, thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Clearly, we have a very intense uh, diplomatic activity since the, the appointment of the new government and the new Minister of Foreign Affairs. Uh, for the first time, as you said, uh, Lapid was in Brussels, and uh, for the first time also th for the last 12 years, an Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs spoke uh, with the, in the in the European Council of Minister of Foreign Affairs, which is which is something clearly very important, because it, it's uh, it's uh, it's the sign that Israel is back in the European diplomacy, and for us, for us at Telnet, undoubtedly it's a very uh, important. Union. And by the way, a few days ago, uh, Benny Gantz, the Minister of Defense, was also in France to meet with a, with his counterpart. Uh, this uh, this meeting was scheduled for since a long time. But it was also a question about the uh, NSO and Pegasus and, and all the, 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 this mess that we had this last day. But perhaps do you have some in specific information about that, uh, Emmanuel, before we are going to, to some other question uh, about France and the, uh, its policy? Well, as you mentioned, the, uh, the main reason for this meeting, I mean, one of the main reasons for this meeting was, of course, to handle the, the crisis uh, around the Pegasus uh, uh, should we call it scandal or issue, uh, but that was not the only issue, of course. Uh, the, the other major issue that Gans discussed uh, was the French uh, defense ministry is, of course, uh, Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon, which is imploding, which uh, has turned into a failed state, which is being taken over by Hezbollah. And uh, France is one of the few countries in the world today that still has uh, quite an amount of leverage on uh, Lebanon, or at least what is left of it, and therefore uh, Israel is trying to coordinate with France uh, uh, attempts of peace uh, to try and prevent Lebanon's uh, uh, decline into complete collapse and its take over by, uh, by Hezbollah. Okay, so let's go back to, to, to France and the, the relation between France and Israel. We always speak about France when something is wrong in Europe. When France is said to block the resumption uh, of EU-Israel uh, Association Council, that was not meeting for years. Uh, 
uh, is also considered to be the main opponent to consider Hezbollah as a terrorist organization in its uh, entirely, uh, entirety and recently to have been against including Israel in space and quantum project Horizon Europe. Uh, Europe. Uh, uh, but recently also France signal, signaled a willingness to open a new chapter in relation by backing re reinstatement of the Association Council meeting. So uh, we say many things about France, as I said, not everything is uh, is true. It's easy for other for the for the European Commission to say every time that it's the responsibility of France, but it, it's not always the case. But tell me, uh, what is your assessment about what is changing and how important is France in shaping uh, uh, Europe's foreign uh, po policy uh, at this time? So when it comes to France, we have to understand two things. First of all. France has conflicting interests in the Middle East and in the Arab world in general. Uh, on the one hand, it does benefit uh, from uh, teaming up with Israel uh, when it comes to technology, when it comes to fighting terrorism. Uh, the reason why France is cooperating with Israel the past years uh, since the, ma the, the major terrorist attacks in Paris is that because Israel uh, is a major technological power and has added value when it comes to intelligence and struggle against terrorism, uh, France does need this partnership. And also when it comes to energy, France uh, asked last year to join uh, the East Mediterranean uh, Natural Gas uh, Forum, which includes, uh, among other things, uh, Israel, Cyprus, Greek, and other countries. Uh, on the other hand, France also has its own interests uh, in the Arab world uh, and in the Muslim world. Uh, it is not as bad as it was in the 1970s and the 80s, uh, where the uh, when OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Country, uh, had this uh, huge power on importing countries. Today, uh, Western economies, developed economies, are less dependent on oil than they used to be, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the uh, the prices of oil have been declining since 2014. But France needs to uh, needs to balance between its interests vis-à-vis Israel and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Arab world, which is why, which is why it has this policy, which sometimes seen from outside, uh, seems completely contradictory. On the one hand, it promotes Israel's uh, participation in scientific programs within the EU and together with France. But on the other hand, it votes against Israel uh, at uh, um, uh, uh, the UN, at the Security Council and the General Assembly to uh, kind of pay lip service uh, towards its uh, partners and allies in the Arab world. There's another point which is important to understand when it comes to France, and that is the fact that um, you have on the one hand uh, the uh, French president, the Elysee Palace, and on the other hand, you have the French foreign ministry, the Quai d'Orsay. And very often the two uh, clash, even if they're not always aware of it. So for example, when it comes to foreign policy, definitely uh, the, the one setting the tone and the policy is the president at least when he has a majority in parliament. But on the other hand, uh, the Quai d'Orsay is an old institution, a very powerful one. And uh, quite often you have decisions made at the Quai d'Orsay by uh, high ranking officials, uh, which the president himself is not always aware or feigns not to be aware. And it's not always clear if, uh, you know, when the president said, well, I didn't know about this decision, if he's being honest or facetious, but definitely uh, this, uh, you have this, uh, uh, duality, I would say, both in terms of France's sometimes conflicting interests vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Arab world on the one hand, and the other the duality is, as I said, it's more institutional within France itself uh, between the Elysee Palace and uh, the Foreign Ministry of the Quai d'Orsay. Yes, I, I, can, I can testify that uh, not always the president or the government or the members of the parliament are aware about what uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, what we call, as you said, the Quai d'Orsay, uh, is doing. Because there is the, this is a kind of deep state with the business as usual. And uh, for years, they were uh, used to vote uh, certain resolutions and they are not asking themselves if it's, it's wrong or good uh, till they don't receive uh, another information coming from uh, from the president himself or from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. So it's another story and we will have uh, more to say about that perhaps in the, in, the, in, the, in the near future in other conferences. But let's go back to what we said at the beginning with this, uh, you participate, uh, Emmanuel, 
to this delegation of a member of French Parliament uh, that came to Israel, 38 uh, among them, which was a very important delegation in quantity and also in quality, because we had very senior, very high level uh, parliamentarians coming from all the groups in the, in the, in the National Assembly and in the Senate, uh, from the right to the left, uh, for sure, except the extreme that we are not taking with us. Uh, all, of the, all of them were not clearly our friends, as we could say, but most of them came to express uh, a friendship with Israel in, in some way. Um, the majority of them were never in Israel. For them, it was the first time, which is very interesting and important. And, and you had the, the privilege and also the opportunity to, to meet them and to speak also uh, with, with them. So uh, they said during their visit that uh, France's view of Israel's security challenges is, grad is gradually changing due to concerns about Iran's nuclear program and terror and, su terror and support for terrorism. Uh, do you think that the, uh, the shared threat uh, of terrorism bring France uh, closer to Israel? Is this something that is working also like that? So unfortunately, um, you know, these, um, the effect of terrorism on public, public opinion and policy uh, kind of uh, uh, fades with time. Uh, in other words, when you look at... Uh, the major terrorist attacks that happened in France in the past uh, five years. So generally, uh, you know, immediately after those attacks, you had uh, a sharp increase in uh, intelligence and defense cooperation uh, between France uh, and Israel. But as, as time goes, and of course, uh, God forbid, I don't wish uh, any terrorist attacks uh, in France, obviously, but what I'm saying is that uh, generally, you know, with time, the memory of those attacks uh, tends to fade. And, um, and in that sense, in that sense, the awareness uh, of terrorism uh, is proportional uh, to the uh, numbers of, of uh, terrorist attacks in France uh, itself. This being said, this being said, I think more and more people uh, in the French establishment, uh, in the defense establishment, uh, come to realize that the danger from Iran uh, is not only Iran's support for terrorism uh, throughout the Middle East, but also in Europe, also in, in South America and in Africa. And I, I reminded you before that uh, France is the, uh, the major provider uh, of uh, military presence uh, against the uh, jihadists in, uh, in Africa, many of whom are supported by, uh, by Iran. So the French uh, defense establishment is definitely aware of the uh, Iranian threat. And, um, and when it comes to uh, dealing with Iran, uh, from France and being aware of the danger of Iran. Uh, with the recent attacks, <clears throat> sorry, uh, by the Iranians uh, against uh, uh, Israeli shipping, but also against uh, Sunni states in the, uh, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and since France, uh, as you may know, has, a, uh, uh, has a, a naval basis in the United Arab Emirates uh, and is definitely a participant, I would say, uh, in the US-led effort to counter uh, the Iranian threat in the, in the Gulf. Uh, definitely, when it comes to the defense establishment, and we spoke before uh, about the uh, sometimes this duality between the Elysee Palace and the uh, foreign ministry, but when it comes to the defense ministry, I think they're quite aware of the Iranian threat. And I think that what is important for us, and for you, of course, is to make sure that this, uh, uh, this uh, perceived threat of Iran by the French uh, uh, military and defense establishment uh, kind of uh, uh, influences also opinion makers and journalists and uh, parliamentarians who are not always aware uh, of uh, what Iran uh, is up to. Uh, so, for example, and I'll finish with this, when it comes to uh, Iran's uh, long-range um, missile program, uh, this is something that anybody familiar uh, with military technology and with uh, uh, Iran's activity in that field is aware. And as I said, the French uh, defense establishment is definitely aware of the fact that Iran's long-range uh, missile program is a threat to Europe and to France. But this is something that has to be said and explained. Uh, obviously, the uh, French uh, defense ministry uh, is not a PR company. They're not talking about this. But these are messages that need to be, uh, that needs to be uh, conveyed uh, to the general public opinion 
And, uh, and hence, again, the importance of an organization like, uh, like Elnet and this contact with parliamentarians to, to bring to the knowledge uh, what, uh, what they should be aware of. Thank you, uh, Manuel. Let, let's speak a little bit about the uh, Israel boycott in, uh, in the world and mostly in Europe. Recently, Ben & Jerry, uh, the ice cream uh, seller, decided to boycott Israel's settlement. It was, ex it was expected at the beginning to boycott all Israel. Um, do you expect more companies to follow in Europe? and uh, uh, specifically in France that have a very strong legislation against the boycott. Do you think that something like that could happen in Europe mostly? And how do you assess the, the importance of this uh, boycott of, of Ben & Jerry's? So first of all, the, uh, the companies that uh, generally announce uh, such boycotts uh, do so under the pressure uh, of the BDS uh, movement. Now we have to understand that uh, thankfully the BDS movement uh, has mostly been a flop. Uh, it was founded in 2005 uh, and according to Bloomberg, foreign investments in Israel between uh, 2005 and 2015 tripled. So obviously uh, BDS is ineffective. Thankfully, uh, the bottom line is that it's impossible to boycott a high-tech uh, economy. However, here and there, this movement is able to blackmail, threaten, uh, uh, companies and convince them to join the BDS movement, uh, which is what happened this time with Ben and Jerry's, but also happened three years ago, four years ago uh, with Airbnb. Now, the the strategy uh, is pretty straightforward. It was already implemented in 2018 vis-a-vis -vis Airbnb, and it works. It can, it is based on uh, the strategy has to include two elements. A uh, it is to expose the double standard of the companies deciding to impose a boycott only on the West Bank. Why do I say double standards? Because there are dozens of disputed and or occupied territories around the world. And therefore, what happened with Airbnb is that we said, well, why don't you guys impose such a, uh, you know, a, a boycott also or restriction on uh, other disputed territories such as Northern Cyprus, uh, Western uh, Sahara or Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, these are territories that have a similar uh, uh, legal status. And there you do business without any restriction. And we're not even talking about China and Xinjiang because, you know, in the case of Xinjiang, everybody can say, well, you know, China is an economic superpower. We cannot uh, afford to boycott them. But, you know, Cyprus and, uh, and Georgia and, um, and Morocco are not economic superpowers. So this was actually very useful and powerful in the case of Airbnb because once their double standard was exposed, and by the way, I don't even think they were aware of it. You know, when we told them, look at you guys, you are still listing uh, apartments on your website in Northern Cyprus and Western Sahara. Why are you still doing this? And then they realized that they had a double standard, so we exposed them. That's the first thing. The second thing is that uh, in the past few years, uh, very strict anti-boycott laws have been uh, passed in the US in uh, about 35 states. And as you mentioned, Arie, also France has very strict anti-boycott laws. And as immediately with BDS, uh, the states in the US that have anti-boycott laws say, well, you are acting against the law by boycotting Israel, and therefore we're going to withdraw our investments, our mutual fund investments in your company. And when they realized that they were going to lose more money from boycotting Israel than from not boycotting Israel, they just uh, back down. So this is what we have to do with Ben & Jerry's. A, as I said, uh, expose the double standard. And B, uh, convey to those companies that if they thought they were going to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, prevent losses by uh, giving in to BDS, well, they have to realize that the cost of boycotting Israel is simply higher economically uh, than of uh, giving in to the pressures of BDS. Don't forget that at the end of the day, those are... Um, uh, companies, their businesses. So they're about uh, making profits. And I think that the combination of those two elements uh, was successful in the case of uh, Airbnb, therefore, hopefully will work also with Ben and & Jerry's and therefore, hopefully, uh, the, uh, there won't be too many companies tempted uh, by this uh, policy when they see what happens to them. As I wrote uh, uh, on Twitter, I believe, after the, BD, after the Ben & Jerry decision, uh, quote, I'm sorry to quote myself, uh, we have to uh, make sure that those companies 
uh, fear Israel more than they fear BDS. We will see. Um, let's go back to, to Lebanon. Uh, Golda Meir said uh, that she, does, she, she doesn't know who will be the first country to make peace with Israel. But what was sure for her is that the second one will be Lebanon. And we see that uh, Lebanon now is in a very bad situation. There is an impending uh, crisis there. And France has been traditionally very involved uh, toward uh, Lebanon. It will host an aid conference on August 4, a year after a massive port blast devastated uh, Beirut. And all of us remember this terrible situation. What, what could be our expectation uh, toward this situation between France and, and Lebanon? Is, are things able to, to move in the right way or do you think that it will conduct us to nowhere? Look, when it comes to Lebanon and expectations, you should keep your expectations as low as possible. Uh, because uh, the situation now in Lebanon is that the country uh, that was described in the 1960s uh, as Switzerland of the Middle East uh, has become today the Somalia uh, of the Middle East. Uh, and the main reason for that is that, first of all, don't forget that Lebanon was destroyed from inside, uh, first of all, by the PLO in the 1970s, uh, when the PLO uh, was expelled from Amman in 1970 after the Black September. Uh, it created a state within a state uh, in Lebanon, uh, conducting terrorist attacks, missile attacks against northern Israel from southern Lebanon. And uh, when the Lebanese Christians uh, convinced Israel that if we, if we would uh, interfere on their behalf, uh, they would retake control of their country, where well, we know exactly what happened. Uh, it was a disaster, the first Lebanon war, instead of giving back the country to the Christians, uh, in fact, turned into a complete disaster for, uh, for Israel. The uh, Lebanese Christian turned out to be completely unreliable, expecting Israel to do all the work for them, and they didn't really fight. And, um, uh, you know, when uh, eventually, uh, Israel kicked out Arafat and the PLO uh, from Lebanon in 1982. At the end of the day, uh, it was replaced by Hezbollah. And this was uh, three years after the, uh, uh, the revolution, the Islamic revolution in Iran. And Hezbollah, uh, being a proxy of Iran, eventually replaced the PLO in being a state within a state uh, with this... Uh, uh, with, with this uh, uh, role, I would say, of being a parasite inside the, inside the country uh, and basically taking control of it. Uh, today, it's not only that uh, Hezbollah uh, actually runs the south of the country. I mean, Lebanon is no longer a country. You have different sectors of the country controlled by different factions. When it comes to the southern part of the country, there is no sovereignty from the uh, Lebanese government. It is definitely uh, uh, run by Hezbollah with an arsenal of about 100,000 uh, 100, missiles directed uh, at Israel. And, and what happens is that uh, the president of, uh, of Lebanon, uh, Michel Aoun, uh, is, uh, is a Christian, uh, but despite being a Christian, he is de facto and tacitly and openly, in fact, uh, uh, collaborating with Hezbollah and, uh, and Iran. Uh, he has been compared, by the way, to uh, to Philippe Pétain in France as being a collaborator, uh, basically because he got his job thanks to, um, thanks to Hezbollah. And, uh, and therefore, uh, he's been collaborating with Hezbollah and Iran. And as long as he's in charge, as long as he's president, uh, there's really no real prospect of uh, reducing or ending the influence of Lebanon. Now, the problem is now that because Lebanon has been so mismanaged, and you remember a year ago, there was this uh, explosion, this disastrous explosion uh, uh, at the port of, uh, of Beirut. Since then, Lebanon hasn't had a government. Um, and it, it really is today basically a failed state. So the, the French and the Americans and other countries, and in, especially in Europe, uh, have been helping Lebanon economically. But in recent months, I said, look, guys, if you don't get your act together, if you don't have a government, we're not going to uh, subsidize uh, your, uh, your failed state. And this is why you've had this economic crisis, which we've uh, seen and read about in the past, uh, in the past few weeks. The, the government that was, thrown in, that, that was sworn in a few days ago is, in fact, a fake uh, government, uh, which was only appointed in order uh, 
to try and get again the uh, uh, the donation from uh, from the donor countries. Uh, but it it the behind the scenes Hezbollah uh, is still in charge. Now the bottom line is the the question is can the U.S. and can France uh, basically uh, reduce to a minimum uh, the influence of Hezbollah in the country? Unfortunately, the answer is no at this point, because uh, as long as Iran defies the West uh, on its nuclear program, uh, as long as uh, Hezbollah is in charge of the country, and as long as the president of Lebanon uh, is basically helping Hezbollah in Iran, uh, to basically destroy his country, I don't see which type of leverage uh, France and the United States can have on Lebanon except for holding the money. Uh, but holding the money, you know, it, it only works for a certain amount of time because whenever uh, Lebanon descends into chaos, so the, the donor countries say, okay, fine, we'll, we'll help you again until you get a government. So it, it's, uh, therefore, they don't really have any leverage because, because uh, Hezbollah has become much too strong in the country. And as long as the Iranian regime is in place, and as long as it is negotiating with the West uh, and defying the West, uh, I don't see, unfortunately, any realistic prospect of, um, of uh, the US and France and other countries having any leverage on that, uh, on that uh, country. Yes, that sounds uh, exact, my friend. So let's go to the to my last question because before going to the Q and A with the audience, uh, let's speak about the GCPOA. Uh, U.S. intend to return to GCPOA and make it stronger and longer. Negotiations are currently on hold until the new Iranian president takes office mid-August, in a few days from now. While Iran keeps breaching nuclear limits and stabilizing the region, while facing protests spreading across the country, does France, according to you, still believe Khamenei wants a deal? And does it believe it will reach a deal? Is there sufficient coordination with Israel and other regional stakeholders on the issue? What do you think? Honestly, I don't think he needs a deal anymore because. Um, he is reaching the threshold. And uh, thanks to China and Russia, uh, he's been able to, uh, uh, to survive the sanctions. So Khamenei and the, uh, and the Revolutionary Guard in Iran, at this point, in my opinion, no longer have an interest in a deal that would enable them to, on the one hand, slow down the program and benefit from uh, the relief of the sanctions. The sanctions imposed by the US have been painful on the uh, Iranian economy, but on the other hand, the Iranians have been able to count on China and Russia to bypass many of those sanctions and, um, and basically survive economically. So the leverage that the US has on Iran today uh, is limited. And, uh, and at the end of the day, as I said, the Iranian today feel that they're so close to the threshold, uh, uh, thanks to the violation of the agreement in the past three years, that uh, they're happy to negotiate to buy for more, to buy more time, and maybe to get some uh, release of the sanctions. Uh, but uh, objectively, but fortunately, uh, when you look at how close they are to the threshold, and how the Chinese and the Russians have helped them bypass U.S. sanctions. Um, you know, just look at the behavior. They're basically telling the U.S., you know, who are you? We don't, we don't really need you. And, and their provocations uh, against uh, Israeli and, uh, and uh, Emirati targets in the Sea of Oman and in the, the Gulf, uh, uh, in the Persian Gulf, uh, clearly indicate that they feel today that they can afford uh, to, uh, to provoke Israel in the United States. Uh, even the, uh, the Biden administration, when you look at the uh, statements, some official, some less so, coming from the Biden administration, the expectations are very low about reaching a new agreement uh, with the new uh, Iranian regime. Uh, don't forget that the new president was not actually elected by the people. He was handpicked by the supreme leader. Uh, and the fact that Khamenei uh, decided to choose a hardliner, 
clearly indicates that he's not into uh, reaching an agreement, a new agreement with the United States, but he's into uh, uh, confronting the United States. And uh, in my opinion, he feels that he can afford to do so. Uh, as I said, both because Iran today is very close to the threshold and B, because the, the sanctions uh, have been, I mean, the, the, the close economic ties between Iran, China and Russia have enabled the Iranian regime to basically bypass uh, the U.S. sanctions and survive economically. And, you know, my last point is that the, um, those regimes always find a way of surviving sanctions. The fact that the people suffers uh, doesn't mean that people, that the, the regime itself uh, is really affected. They always find a way uh, to keep the good life when the people suffer. I mean, uh, and that's also why uh, the regime is still, uh, is still in place. So unfortunately here also, uh, I don't have very high expectations. But the Americans want to go back to return to GCPOA and the Israelis don't want to have the Iranians be a, a threshold, a threshold state. So what, what could be the, the next step? Uh, the situation uh, could stay in this quite of uh, status quo. Well, first of all, <clears throat> there is no returning to the original GCPOA because since uh, the US pulled out in 2018, the Iranians have enriched uranium to very high levels. So the JCPOA um, is no longer in place in the sense that Iran is far uh, uh, beyond the level of enrichment that it was allowed to do under the JCPOA. Also, don't forget that the JCPOA had a sunset close uh, in 2025. We're now in 2021. Uh, so that is, is in four years. And that sunset close was uh, you know, based on the agreement itself, of course, had Iran respected the agreement, uh, it would have uh, if it would have been a three year away, a two year away from the threshold at the end of the JCPOA. Today it's a few months away from the threshold. So what we say, you know, going, getting back to the JCPOA, there's no going back because um, Iran today has reached a level of enrichment far beyond what was allowed by the uh, uh, by the JCPOA. So. Israel here, again, has also very little leverage on what the Americans are going to decide or not decide. But at the end of the day, I think it's pretty clear today, in light of what I've explained, that uh, Israel is going to face, and America is going to face, a, a threshold Iran. Uh, and I think we have to adapt our strategy and our strategic thinking uh, to a world in which Iran is a threshold country, by the way. According to most experts, uh, it would make more sense for Iran uh, to remain a threshold country than to actually uh, build a nuclear bomb. Uh, strategically, it would make more sense for Iran because the cost, the geopolitical and economic cost of uh, building a bomb, uh, just look at North Korea, is very high. On the other hand, uh, being a threshold country and being a few weeks uh, away from the bomb in itself would grant Iran a very strong deterrent and it's very likely that this is good enough uh, for Iran, but that would require from Israel, from the United States, but also from European countries to adapt their strategy and their strategic thinking vis-a-vis -vis Iran.